Why am I here? That was the question that I asked a few months ago. I was under the weather and I wanted to take a COVID test. And so I went on Google and、uh, I was looking, okay, COVID test near me. The place that I usually went earlier last year wasn't open. And so I tried to find something that was close to me so I can get back to work. Well, lo and behold, something that was close to me was this place, this urgent care place, just 10 minutes from here. And I decided to go in. Thought it was going to be free and quick. As you know, the COVID tests usually were. Most of the time, I would stay in the car and they would swab my nose. But I wanted to go. I thought it was going to be quick. I went inside the urgent care. And the lady told me,、uh, Sir,、uh, can I see your insurance? Insurance? I, okay. So I pulled my insurance and she said, Okay. Where's your license? Okay. Insurance, license, fill out these three or four forms. Three or four forms? Okay. I thought it was going to be quick. All right, fine. So I sat down.、Uh, I, I filled out the forms, waited like 10 or 15 minutes, got back up, gave it back to her. She said, Well,、uh, you're gonna, we need your insurance because you're going to pay, you're gonna pay、uh, you know, you're, you're gonna pay a lot. Pay a lot? How much? Well, your insurance will cover most of it, maybe $125, $150. Okay, I just want a COVID test. So I sat there, right, waiting 10, 15 minutes. And then after, in the wait, after I waited there for 10, 15 minutes, I, I slipped into another room where the, this lady was taking my vitals. It's like, all right, let me check your vitals, make, make sure that you know, your blood pressure. I'm like, I just want a COVID test. <laughs> Why am I here? She said, Well, we followed this protocol, and, and, and this is the, the, the procedure that we, we follow with every, every patient that wants to get tested here. Okay. So I waited another 10 or 15 minutes, and then they brought me into another room. And then I was in the third room, wondering, Why am I here? And then the lady said, Okay, can you remove your shirt? Remove my shirt. <laughs> I'm trying to take, I want to take a COVID test. Okay, I just a quick COVID test. How much is this going to cost? Well, it could be probably around $200. And at that point, I said, okay, I think it's time for me to go. I have a, a testing kit at home and I'm just going to test myself at home. Every room that I was in, I was asking the question, why am I here? Why am I here? Why am I here? And the answer to that question will either Waste your resources, your time, your money, your energy, or will help you maximize your resources. I didn't want to waste any more time. I definitely wanted, didn't want to waste money on a test that I had at home. So I, did, I, did, I, I drove back home, I took that test, and thank God I was okay. Why am I here? Why are we here? That's the question that we are asking in this new sermon series. We're going to be in this series five weeks. We're going to be only in five verses, the last five verses of the book of Matthew, to ask the question why church? Why do we come? Why do we do church? Why do you do church? Why do you believe? Why do we believe? We are exploring our purpose. We are exploring our mission. We are trying to answer the question why are we here? Because if we don't answer that question, if we don't answer that question, We might be wasting our resources, our time, our energy, our money. But if we ask the question, why here? Why now? Why are we here? We can maximize our resources. So, what we're going to do this morning is to discover the purpose of our existence. I'm going to give you 15 seconds, okay? 15 seconds to turn to your neighbor and, 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 and share what you think the purpose is of why we come to church, okay? I'm going to give you, actually, I'll give you. Yeah, 15 seconds. Seven seconds each person, maybe one extra for the person that wants to go a little longer. Why do we come to church? Ready? Go. I'm counting. Two, three, five. Five more seconds. Ding, 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 ding. Okay, time's up. Sorry. Give me some quick answers. Why is it we come to church? What is the purpose of coming to church or doing church? Quick answers. Worship, what else? Fellowship, what else? Honoring God. All right, that's what we're going to find out this morning. 
we're going to find out what is our purpose. And I want to give you a clue. Our purpose is not our mission. Our primary purpose is not our mission. And that's what we're going to figure out this morning. So come with me. Book of Matthew. We're in the book of Matthew. Is that in the Old Testament or the New Testament? It's in the New Testament. Bring out, pull out your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, uh, pull it up on your, the Bible on your app, whether it's your phone or your tablet. That's okay. You have to see this. Matthew chapter 28. We're going to be, be starting in verse 16. Okay? Verse 16. Matthew chapter 28, verse 16. Uh, many scholars believe that these last five verses summarize the entire book of Matthew. And so we're going to these five verses, these next five weeks, to find out what our purpose and our mission is as believers, as a church, as individuals. This morning we're going to answer three questions. Question one, what's the primary purpose of the church? Number two, why are we hesitant about that purpose? And number three, how do we overcome our hesitancy? Question number one, what is the primary purpose of the church? Verse 16, here we go. The text says this, Matthew chapter 28, verse 16. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Galilee. Galilee. What's going on here? Jesus tells them, hey, disciples, go meet me there. Well, what happened here? What's, what's going on? Jesus was just crucified. Two ladies by the name of Mary. They come visit the tomb. And here in the same chapter... The text says about those two ladies, they come to the tomb, verse 2, Behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men, verse 5. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you see Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. And he said, and he, as he said, Come see the place where he lay. The ladies look at each other. Are you serious? What? Go quickly, go quickly, go quickly. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. Verse 8, so they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples, he's out of the grave, he's resurrected. And guess who shows up on the scene? Verse 9, and behold, Jesus met them. Hey, ladies. Jesus met them. And he said, greetings. Greetings to you. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. First thing that they did was what? Worship, then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Just a side note. Jesus called his disciples his disciples, and then in his last supper he called them friends. But now he calls them brothers. Your family now. Your family now. Tell my brothers to meet me there in Galilee. If you put together Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll figure out that Jesus actually met them prior to going to this hill. And I can imagine Jesus meeting the 11 and saying to the disciples, Disciples, meet me at that hill. I have something to tell you. Meet me at that mountain and that hill. And so in verse 16 again, Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. All right, guys, are you ready? Let's go, let's go, let's go. So they walk to this mountain. It's really a hill in the Greek. They're coming to this hill where Jesus directed them to go. And then uh, look at what the text says. Verse 17, and they saw him and they worshipped him. The first question that we're trying to answer is this. What is the primary purpose of the church? You see, Jesus returns to where he started. He lived his life, his, his childhood in Nazareth of Galilee. His first miracle was done in Cana of Galilee when he turned water into wine. And it was in the, by the Sea of Galilee that he called his first disciples. After about three years of following Jesus, the disciples, they come back home. They're excited. They see Jesus. And the text says that the first thing that they do, that they do just like Mary, the two Marys did, was that they... Worshipped. They worshipped. That's the first thing that they did. Now, what, is, what does the word worship mean? What does the word worship mean? A lot of times we think that, you know, worship is bowing down and then they, 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 uh, they, they change the posture of their body to, to bow down before Jesus. And yeah, that, that is worship. That is worship. But 
the, the word here for worship is not just a bowing. It's actually a, a full recognition that Jesus Christ is divine. So it's not so much a posture of their body, but the posture of their heart. Let me explain it this way. Uh, this same Greek word for worship that shows up here in Matthew 28, verse 17, also shows up in another story in, in Matthew chapter 14, when Jesus was walking on water, and Peter, that very uh, confident man, in 14, verse 28, and Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to the water. And then so Jesus said, come, all right, you come. So Peter, he's going out of the boat, he's walking on water, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid, right? He was supposed to look at Jesus. He looked at the wind instead. And he said, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Verse 32, and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And check out this verse, verse 33. Here's that word. And those in the boat, what did they do? They worshiped him. Same Greek word. And what did they say? Truly, you are the son of God. That's what worship means. Worship is not only a physical uh, posture, a posture of your body. It's the posture of your heart that says, I believe that Jesus is the divine son of God. And the first thing that the two ladies did and the first thing that the disciples do when they saw Jesus was worship. So what is the primary purpose of why we exist as a church? Many times we jump down, in Matthew chapter 28, we jump down to verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples. And we say, aha, that's the primary purpose. We exist primarily to make disciples, to do mission. Is the primary purpose, the first purpose of the church to, do, to go on mission for God? The first purpose, the primary purpose, the chief purpose of the church is to worship. It's to magnify. It's to love and adore God supremely as the greatest object of all of my affections. That above my work and my spouse and my family and my degree and my education and my training, above all of that, even great vacations in Hawaii or Bora Bora or wherever, above all of that, the greatest, the most, the, the chiefest, chief, is that even a word, the chiefest, the the. The chief joy of my life, the supreme object of my affections, is God. That's the, the primary purpose, is worship. Now some people are saying, oh, okay, well, 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 what about mission? What about evangelism? It, it cannot be the primary purpose because guess what? When Jesus comes again, mission and evangelism and witnessing and giving Bible studies and leading people to Jesus, all of that is going to stop. And what are we going to be doing for eternity? Worship and worship and worship. No more witnessing. I mean, the witnessing will look different. We're going to be testifying about God's goodness forever. But we're not going to be trying to proselytize and reach. And, you know, some people use the language of winning souls or, or, or leading people to Jesus. No, because everyone there is already a believer. So the primary purpose of the church is to worship. It's to magnify. Now, why does, this, why, do, why does this even matter? Here's why it matters. Because if I make mission, making disciples, doing good deeds and service uh, primary, if, if mission is primary, I will never be satisfied. If mission is primary, I'll never be satisfied. Let me explain it this way. If mission, if this church exists only for mission then what happens is I start looking at people as a metric. Oh, how many, how many attendees do we have at church? How much money is coming into the, into the offering plates? How many people have been baptized? How many people are members? If mission is primary, then what is primary is people. We're constantly counting and, and watching. And what happens if, I'm not saying that, that that's not, that's, I'm not saying that that's bad, that's a bad thing. 
But I'm saying is, what I'm saying is that if, if mission is primary, then we are tempted to turn people into commodities, into objects. And my happiness and his joy is based on how many people are coming to church, how many people are coming to my house for a Bible study, how many people are giving to the church. If mission is primary, I will never be satisfied because, because uh, our, our joy will fluctuate based on how many numbers, based on the numbers that we have. Uh, we have a low year at, at church this year uh, in, in terms of our giving. Uh, we're just not good enough. We haven't been trending. Like we, keep, we keep talking to it. Oh, we, just, we didn't have the same attendance. Like last week, I heard that we, we broke records since I've been here. For, we had 260 in the building here. You know, and the, I, I remember when Kenrick was preaching, they put a sign to ask someone with a certain license plate to move their car because there was no space. And so we feel great about ourselves. 260 in attendance. But then when we were at 150 and maybe 20, only 20 online viewers, what happens to that joy? It deflates. Because mission is primary. So if mission is primary, I'll never be satisfied. However, if worship is primary, then God is primary, not people. God is primary, and my joy will always be constant because the object of my joy is not people and how, much, how, how our numbers are doing. My object of my joy is God himself. And in God, I always have a constant, fulfilling joy. Let me uh, illustrate it this way because I, I might be losing you all. Um, let's just take marriage and children, those of you who are married and have children. Did you go into your marriage thinking, mm-hmm, the primary purpose of, my, of me getting married is to have children? Now, there are some people who are really desperate about having children. And there are some people who want to have children and they can't. But did you go into your marriage, at least most marriages, do you go into marriage thinking, I'm going in here because the primary purpose is to fulfill the mission of being fruitful and multiply? Is that your primary purpose? My primary purpose of marrying Catherine was not to have children. It was to worship and adore and love her and receive that back. And from that place of adoration and happiness... We then did, we then fulfilled our mission by being fruitful in our joy of each other, in our love, and from that fruitfulness, we multiplied. Does it make sense? So the primary purpose of me getting married or those of us who are married is not just to do, you know, just to multiply numbers and have children. The primary purpose is to enjoy the marriage. It's to adore each other. And when I adore and worship and taste God's goodness, then and only then do I have something to give. And perhaps the reason why my witness is weak and I'm not participating with God in the joy of sharing Jesus and leading other people to Jesus, maybe could it be that the reason why my witness is weak is because my worship is weak. High worship, strong worship, strong witness. Hey, let me tell you about the first date I had with, with this girl. Yes. Amazing. You're going to tell all your friends about it. Strong adoration and worship, strong witness and mission. And so, friend, I have a question for you, those of you watching online. It's a hypothetical question. It's a question I ask myself. When it comes to worshiping God, how, how primary is it in my life? How primary is worshiping God in my life? And I'm not, friends, I'm not just talking about the, the action of worship, the posture, right, the bodily posture, the, po the posture of my body in opening scripture and kneeling down. I'm not just talking about that. That's important. But behind the, 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 uh, the posture of my body is the posture of my heart. That behind the action, somewhere deep in my heart and my soul, I'm craving God, the only one who can fulfill the greatest desires of my heart. And when you have God, you have everything you need. And like the Samaritan woman, you'll tell everyone. So what is the primary purpose of the church? 
to worship. So if the, primary, if the mission is primary, I'll never be satisfied. But if God is primary, I will always be satisfied. You still don't believe me. What did the first commandment say? You shall have no other gods before me. Worship first. Still don't believe me? Someone came to Jesus and said, what's the greatest commandment? What did he say? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Worship first. And then what? Love your neighbor as yourself, and then you will witness. Worship is primary. Right? So that's the first question. What's the primary purpose of the church? Worship. Number two, why are we hesitant in our worship? And this is exactly what happens. Just three words in verse 17. you got to see this. Matthew 28, verse 17. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. Three words. But some doubted. What? Doubters? The disciples were doubters? <laughs> what does that mean? How could the disciples worship and some, of them, and some of them doubt? The word, the Greek word for doubt here does not mean an intellectual doubt, like how we think about doubt, like I doubt God, I doubt God's existence. It was, uh, it was more practical. The Greek word uh, is, is more of a, a, a practical doubt, like um, a hesitation, okay? In fact, that's what the word uh, can be also translated, hesitation. So you could read it as, uh, verse 17, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some hesitated. They hesitated. Um, interestingly enough, the Greek word for hesitate here in Matthew 28 only shows up twice in the entire New Testament, both used by Matthew. And the word, the Greek word for hesitate or for doubt shows up in the same story about Peter in Matthew chapter 14. And remember, Matthew chapter 14, Peter said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come. Verse 29, come. So Peter got out, he went to the water, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? Same Greek word, only used twice in the New Testament. Right? Matthew 28, they worship, some doubted, Greek word. Matthew 14, Peter, you of little faith, why did you doubt? In other words, Peter, why did you hesitate? Why did you hesitate? Peter had a choice. So, you know, imagine if you're walking on water. He had a choice. He's walking on water. I see the wind. He's hesitating. Do I trust the wind that's tangible and that I can see? Or do I trust Jesus who is intangible? Like I see him, but I don't really know if I can trust his words. Peter was hesitating between two practical options when he was sinking. Do I trust the wind which is tangible? that I can see, that my senses see? Or do I trust Jesus and his words, something I'm still trying to believe? It's intangible. In Matthew 28, the disciples are worshiping. And they're, they're, they're on their knees, they're worshiping Christ. The text says that some doubted, some hesitated, and they're hesitating between two options. Do I trust the credible, tangible Jesus that we've just journeyed with for three and a half years? Or do I trust the incredible, intangible Jesus that I cannot understand that just came out of the grave? They were hesitating between that which was credible or tangible or that which they couldn't understand. I don't understand Christ's nature. The disciples had to hesitate because Jesus is beyond belief, they don't get him. The disciples are hesitating because he is incredible. We don't get him. And so the question that I ask today is why are we hesitant? Those of you watching online, those of us here, why are we hesitant sometimes to believe in Jesus and worship him? Because Jesus is beyond our belief. Because he is way above, he is, he, is, he, is, he is incredible, he is beyond belief. All right, so I'm going to ask you to put your thinking caps here, and then I, trust me, I'm going to try to bring it back to earth 
and apply it, okay? So follow me here. Let me give you some, some examples of why people hesitate. So let's talk to, uh, let me talk to non-believers, those here in our midst or those watching online who you might consider yourself a non-believer. I'm, I'm struggling with my belief in God or I don't believe in, I believe in God. Strong agnostics or atheists in today's culture, uh, they say um, you have to trust your knowledge only. You can't, you can't trust mystery, you can't trust miracles. Um, what you see is what you get. Uh, and what's king right now is reason, right? So you trust reason and reason excludes faith. We don't need faith. That's for you superstitious believers. For us, we are all reason and no faith. And for you believers, you are all faith and little or no reason. Now, that's not true because for both non-believers and believers, non-believers, uh, for believers, yes, we have, we have faith and we believe that Jesus was, you know, was the divine son of God who came uh, through a virgin who died and resurrected. So we have to accept that by faith, but there are reasons for our faith. And for the non-believers, if you're a non-believer today or those, any, anyone watching online, non-believers, yes, you use reason, but I would say, I would, I would say that you also use faith because like the Big Bang Theory, that's a theory. None of us, you weren't there. None of us were there to actually see the Big Bang. So it requires some faith, some type of belief outside of reason, right? So that's for non-believers. But let me apply this especially to the majority of our group here, to believers. Why are we hesitant about believing in Jesus? You know why? Because we trust our knowledge too much. Let me share this with you. Some of us have a hard time believing in Jesus because we, tr we, we trust our knowledge too much. We have systematized him and fit him within a doctrinal package. Okay? So let me explain that. We can take, you know, oh, you want to learn about God? Let me give you five Bible verses. And we've put them in a nice package and we present it to you. Like this is even this sermon, that I'm, I'm, this message. I've packaged the scripture in a certain way. And I'm trying to, you know, give you, give you knowledge to understand, right, to grow in your faith. What we have done is we have systemized Christ and we have tried to fit him into a doctrinal package. And if you just follow these five verses, then you can believe in God. And we trust our knowledge too much. And here's, here's, here's uh, follow, follow my reasoning here. What happens is that we trust our propositions too much and yet we have not known the person. We trust our propositions too much and we have not known the person. So let's take my marriage license, for example. I have evidence that Catherine and I are married in a document, right? What's the proof of my marriage? That document? The proposition that Nestor and Catherine were married on July 7, 2013. Is that the proof of my marriage? The proof of my marriage isn't the proposition or that document. The proof of my marriage is the person. It's, it's Catherine herself. And my fear, and why I'm bringing this up, my fear is that some of us young adults, people who have grown up within this community of faith and within church tradition, think of God merely as a set of propositions that you have to follow. And I see it. I have conversations with people who are having conversations that he is merely, that Jesus is merely an idea. And we portray it with authority as saying, you have to believe this. When yet behind that proposition and the idea and that doctrine is a person. Behind the marriage certificate is my wife, Catherine. Catherine. The marriage certificate, yeah, that's great. But behind the idea and that certificate is a beautiful, mysterious person called Catherine. And yes, friends, I know everything about her. Think about your lover. Your lover is beautifully knowable. You know, you know everything about her or him. But at the same time, you realize that you don't know a lot about your lover. Look, I'm coming up to 10 years this July. 10 years of marriage, all right? 10 years of marriage, hallelujah, I am a blessed man. Catherine is beautifully knowable. What I do know, 
is beautiful and what I see is beautiful. But there's also a lot I don't know about her. There's a mystery about her that's also beautiful. Jesus is both knowable and unknowable and and unknowable. He's mysterious. He's tangible. He's intangible. The disciples are confused. Uh, Okay, I see Jesus, but now he's resurrected and he's talking to us. It doesn't make sense. Jesus is, is not less than doctrine. We need doctrine and teaching. We need that. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we don't need scripture. We need, the, we need doctrine. We need teaching. But behind the doctrine and the teaching is an actual person that wants to take me on an adventure and wants to show me things about myself that I've never seen before in my life. Are you still lost? Jesus said, John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, proposition, ideas, and the life. I am a person that I want to, I I want to know you. And so why does this even matter? Because we can have a relationship with this, this, this person that we understand but also don't understand, that he is mysterious. And I believe that some of us hesitate because the Jesus that you know is merely, is merely an idea. But behind that idea, look, when I get on my knees and I pray, the primary way that God speaks to me is through his word. But Jesus tells me that when I go into my closet, I'm not just talking to, I'm not just talking to a Bible, like an inanimate object. Like I have, God is in my closet. And I can actually talk to him and know him, and love him, and he can take me on these amazing journeys. And so my question for us is why do we hesitate? We hesitate because Jesus is so incredible that we can't understand him. Question number one, what's the primary purpose of the church? To worship. What's, uh, question number two, why are we hesitant to worship? Because Jesus is incredible. We can't really understand him, but we can understand him. It's both and. That he is, he, and this is exactly, this is, I can't, you know, honestly, I, I was trying to put my mind together and understand this text. I'm trying to wrestle, I'm wrestling with, as, as much as you're wrestling, I'm wrestling. What does this mean that they were worshiping and they were hesitating? That's my best attempt. That when they saw Jesus, after he was resurrected, they really couldn't understand, like, are we really seeing this with our own eyes, that he's talking to us right now with nails through his hands and his feet? But that's the relationship that God wants us to enter with him. That you can know me and you can know that you're saved, but at the same time, I'm going to reveal mysteries that you've never known before. All right, I lost you, I know. Third question, how do we overcome our hesitancy? Verse 19. And friends, without, uh, actually verse 18. Without verse 18, we really don't have verses 19, 20, and 20, verses 19 and 20. Last text, and then we're done. Verse 19 says, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So the resurrected Jesus comes to his disciples and he's saying, hey disciples, I now have all authority. I am the king of the universe. I'm the king. I now have all authority in heaven and on earth. Matthew chapter one, you know, this kingship uh, theology or the understanding of Jesus as king is all throughout Matthew because he's writing to the Jewish people. And the text says in Matthew 1 verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Matthew is trying to portray and to teach that Jesus is king. And then when Jesus is uh, coming into Jerusalem on a cult, the people cry out in Matthew 21 verse 9, Hosanna to the son of David. Jesus is king. And all of the Jews and the disciples knew this kingship verse. This is why they were looking for the Messiah, the king, who would deliver them out of Roman bondage. Daniel chapter 7, verse 14. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Aha. So what's Jesus telling his disciples? He's telling disciples, I have all authority. In other words, I am king. Disciples, listen up. I am in charge. I'm in charge. And so friends, here is where the rubber meets the road for us. If Jesus is the king of the universe, he's the king of the the stars, the planets, the moon, the sun, 
he's the king, the, the, the king of this, this, this world, then he's the king of your life. And if Jesus is the king of your life, then he is for you. That he wants to do everything that he can to take care of his citizens. He is for you. He is on your side. Now there are some people here, you're wrestling. I'm having a hard time really believing right now. You don't, you don't, you don't Pastor, you, don't, you have no idea the stress and the anxiety that I'm feeling every single day. You have no idea. And then you, you say, like, why would God allow this? Why would God allow this in my life? Why would I have to go through this? The disciples are like, come on, I'm worshiping, but I'm hesitating. I can't understand why we have to go through this. You know what Jesus says? All authority has been given to me. I'm king. If I choose to bring you to the mountaintop, I'll bring you to the mountaintop. And if I choose to bring you into the valley, I'll bring you into the valley. Because I know what's best for you, my friend, my brother. I know what's best for you. Through the mountain, through the valley, I'm for you. I am king. And so how do we overcome our hesitancy? We receive the king. We let him into our lives. Our primary purpose is to worship him supremely. But you and I know that as much as we try to worship, we hesitate. We hesitate because we cannot comprehend this incredible nature of Jesus. Or we're blinded by our own knowledge. We're blinded by our own, our own, uh, our own senses. We don't really trust and really jump in and, and, and see that Jesus is amazing. We hesitate. But when I hesitate, I need to remember that Jesus hesitated too. Did you know that? In the Garden of Gethsemane, I don't believe he lost faith. I don't believe he doubted. He doubted God. But I believe that he hesitated. And it was in Gethsemane that he was stuck between two options. Do I remain comfortable and not fulfill my mission? Or do I fulfill my mission? Jesus had called for three disciples said, hey, come pray with me. Please pray for me. But they went to sleep. Come on, support me. And how does it feel when, when some of your best friends fall asleep when they, you need their support? The agony of that decision in that space of hesitancy was so agonizing that Luke says that he was sweating blood from his brow. He was sweating blood. But it was in that space of hesitancy that somewhere deep inside of his heart as he, he held on to God, he said, although I am hesitant, my God, let this come past from me, nevertheless not my will, but your will be done. Somehow in that hesitancy, Jesus decides to have resilience and he resolves in his mind that I'm going to go forward with the plan. And the very next scene, he's betrayed, he's captured, and you know the rest of the story, he was crucified as an innocent man. He was crucified. He dies, he resurrects out of the grave, and the rest is history. And so friend, in that place when you're hesitant to believe in God and to trust in him, in that hard, in that hard place, in that hard time that you're experiencing, just know that the only way that I can worship without hesitation is this, by, believe, by believing and receiving the one who hesitated for me. The one who hesitated and who resolved to save me. And it is by faith, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that whoever believes in him, whoever believes and receives this king, the one who sacrificed all, when I believe and receive that king, I have everything that I need. And then life begins to make sense. Although the, king is, although the king is mysterious and incredible, you don't understand everything about him, you can still know him, you can still have him, and he can still have you. Last story. Got two pictures this week. Last week, Friday, eight days ago, my sister said that my nephew Zane, five-year-old boy, was taken off ECMO, okay? Hallelujah. 37 days on ECMO, they took that off. He's still on a ventilator and still on life support. 
My sister sent two pictures t- uh, this week. First picture uh, it was a picture of my sister lying next to her son in the same hospital bed. I said, oh, how precious that was. But then she sent me this picture that I'm just going to look at right now. She sent me a picture yesterday, and this was at 3.14 p.m. It's a picture of Zane sitting upright and with her fully embracing him, the first kind of hug that she had with her son. He's been at Colmer Children's Hospital for what, almost two months now. Sick Zane, in and out of consciousness. He's getting OT now, physical therapy, occupational therapy, improving, in and out of consciousness. But yet, he has the wherewithal to still receive my sister's embrace. As sick as he is, and as mysterious as the, the, uh, the nurses and the medical staff and my sister and, her and my, my brother-in-law look, can't really grasp everything, as mysterious as all of that is, he still received the embrace of my sister. And friend, I don't know what kind of hesitancy you're experiencing in your life. You're sick with doubt. You're sick with hesitancy. Things don't make sense. But even in your hesitancy, there's still a loving father who's saying, hey, it doesn't make sense, but I'm here to embrace you. And so the question, the question is am I I willing to receive that embrace? Let me tell you something. It almost brings tears to my eyes to see this picture. Let him embrace you. Let him in. Our praise team is going to come up. This is the story that we want to tell. The story of a king who embraces us and who loves us one that we adore and worship. And look, if you've been touched by today's message, something within the teaching today has struck a chord in your heart. We have a connect card in the pew in front of you. Take the pew card, mark, beginning a relationship with Jesus. Hey, I'm interested in joining a Bible study group. Or you have a prayer request. Write that in, put your name and number. You can drop it off in the offering plate on your way out. We even have uh, the connect card uh, on the screen. Scan that QR code. Those of you watching online, go to that website. Fill the, fill, the t- fill the same uh, card out and we'd love to get in touch with you and walk alongside you in your journey with Jesus. Let's receive his embrace. Can we do that? We're going to sing to Christ and we're going to sing about his glory. Let's rise up. Let's stand together and let's rise up and let's sing to this Christ.